CSI Road mostly, the same CSI Road, but we've managed to kind of break them over here and kind of engage them a little bit in some stuff with us, which has been an absolute pleasure. So when Brian was coming over, he actually, his partner works for the Nature Conservancy and my partner works, and I was talking to Eddie and about it. And his words were, he's one of the smartest ecologists of this generation. You need to talk to him. And you know what, he was, he was right. Brian is an incredibly smart guy, but he's also an incredibly generous and nice guy. And so I'm really happy that he's been able to come and work a bit with my group and hopefully engage with you guys a bit more because we can certainly learn from the way he's thinking, the things that he's trying to do. And I feel like we can also kind of create some really interesting work by bringing in some of the conservation angle and the, the different It's great to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, really had a, a wonderful time interacting with people at CSIRO and uh, here at UQ. I look forward to potential collaborations. And this talk is about incorporating ecological theory and understanding into conservation practice and making sure we can get all that we can out of our designs. And the way we're looking at that is taking our understanding of cooperation, mutualistic theory, understanding how that varies in time and space, and then asking ourselves, have we incorporated all the positive species interactions that we can into these conservation? And if not, what happens if you do? Does that change the trajectory? So I want to start off with a little story. I got uh, hooked on this idea maybe 15, 20 years ago. I was in Chile with Mark Pertinus, who was, I was just starting my PhD. And we were interested to look at how interactions between individuals change along with some kind of physical stress gradient. So we went down the marshes along the Chilean coast and we planted plants along a uh, oxygen stress gradient uh, with and without neighbors. And we looked, we wanted to see the growth. So we set that up and we came back three months later. The problem was during that three month period, there was a tsunami that came in and brought sand all over the dunes and then landed on the salt marshes. And so it put about four inches, it was a perfect amount of sand on the marsh, and we went back to our plots, we still see the PVC poles. And interestingly, the only plants that survived were ones that we had put in clumps that had neighbors around them. And this was predicted by theory, but the idea was is that under high disturbance um, and high stress conditions, having neighbors is really important and can lead to increased success. In that case, that looked like it was, it was an ecological experiment, but it was similar to restoration. And one of my ideas was, well, what happens if we uh, incorporate positive species interactions into restoration or conservation designs? Does it change the trajectory? Um, I'd like to start with the acknowledgments. This, this work has been uh, led by students and postdocs. They deserve uh, most of the credit here. And also acknowledge, I'm, I'm over here because of the Fulbright. Uh, there's an amazing, Australian probably has the strongest Fulbright um, program. And there are over, uh, 200 scholarships, fellowships now for Australians to come to America. And they're probably the, I have the strongest monetary support of any Fulbright here. So if anybody wants to come over, come and let me know. Uh, the Lindfest program and the National Science Foundation for their work here. So uh, the goals of any conservation project are you have a target of interest and you want to stop the decline or increase the concentration uh, for instance, uh, a population, a community, or an ecosystem function. So the idea is to identify that target and stabilize it or increase it uh, over time. In marine systems, uh, looking at restoration and conservation, a lot of the paradigm in which we work was taken from forestry science about 40 or 50 years ago. And the idea was that you need to watch out for competition. So keep these animals and plants away from each other as the ecosystem is establishing and therefore you will increase the productivity and the regrowth of the community over time. Indeed, if you look at or participate any in marine conservation projects, there's a discussion like this in the room, a target will be identified, population, community, or function, and then typically you go over uh, thinking about all the threats that could impale or impair that, that, that population or target from going back. You look out for physical stressors and try to reduce those in designs, you look out for human impacts, uh, and you do that with protected areas of management of human behavior. And we also think about suppressing negative species interaction, watch out for competition, 
an invasive species of vaccine. And if you put all that together, the conversation really focuses on systematically identifying and avoiding negative interactions that will suppress population growth. But we all know as ecologists that positive species interactions are paramount to these systems for their stability, their resilience, and their growth over time. This is an example of a salt marsh ecosystem off the east coast of North Carolina. And their expansion on the backside of Barrier Islands is tied exclusively with the formation of these oyster reefs right here on the fringe. So this is a bivalve reef. They start to form, uh, they grow over time, build up land, and they move seaward over time. And due to their building of land and the backing of waves, they allow an entire ecosystem that's not touching with it to develop over time. And that ecosystem can expand over a couple kilometers. So this positive interaction essentially generates and maintains that ecosystem for occurring. And we know from internal textbooks that there are all kinds of cool positive species interactions out there. There are direct facilitations where A facilitates B. One species can have a whopping effect like a foundation species and facilitate up an entire community. Of course, there can be feedbacks and that generates a mutualism. And we also have a series of indirect interactions. You can have evenly numbered uh, negative interactions, two, four, six, that will ge generate one or sequential positive indirect interactions. And this is a really powerful one I'll get to later on, is sequential positive interactions can have synergistic positive effects that are non-additive that can really generate lots of biodiversity. But we also know these interactions aren't just going on with animals that are close to each other. You can also have long distance facilitation where ecosystems uh, that are kilometers apart are actually affecting each other. We know that from, the, of course, the Great Barrier Reef and other reef systems that dampen waves and allow seagrasses and mangroves to uh, coexist in that space. And then mangroves and seagrasses can have positive effects on corals by suppressing uh, sedimentation and sucking up nutrients before it gets to the quarry. So there's long distance facilitation too. So the three questions I'm going to go over are positive species interactions critical for marine ecosystem structure and resilience. Everybody knows, has examples where it's important in your ecosystem or for your population. I'm just going to give you examples uh, from what we have found in coastal systems, how important it is. Uh, when and where are they important? This is really important for not just looking at system specific knowledge, but conceptually can we predict when positive species interactions should be important in any ecosystem or different types of ecosystems or ecosystems experiencing different physical conditions. And experimentally test can inclusion of positive interactions systematically and by design change the trajectory or increase success. So the first story, I, I, one to three slides on each one of these stories, uh, we investigated what controlled biodiversity on Patagonia rocky shores. This is one of the most windswept, driest rocky shores there is. Most of the work on rocky shores has been done in temperate rainforest. And Bob Payne in 1966 came up with the idea of keystone predation. And he found by plucking sea stars off the rocky inner tidal that uh, there was a huge indirect effect of sea stars as predator facilitating biodiversity. When you pulled the sea stars off, mussels started to accumulate on the system and clog it up and knock out biodiversity. So the idea was that keystone predation mediated or enhanced diversity. When we went down to Patagonia Rocky Shores, we did not find any sea stars at all. It was just one mussel, and in fact, we couldn't find any of the organisms that typically occur on the rocky intertidal until we took out our ice scrapers with good rocky intertidal ecologists do. They do disturbance experiments right away, and you pull out these little patches here with how fast they close, with, without species interactions, and that's where all the animals were. It was like the dollhouse, a mini-me of the rocky intertidal world. Snails were like this big. Everything was like a one to two centimeters. And, and these are the biggest crabs we could find. This is the sea star. Asterius minimus, a perfect name for that. So we went back and had some mate, trying to figure out what to do with this system because we were, the keystone predation wasn't there and all the diversity was in the mussels and it wasn't on the rocks. So we asked the question, what is the relative importance in this highly stressed physical system of predation and direct facilitation and controlling biodiversity, uh, recovering physically stressed systems. So we cleared off plots and we excluded predators, had cage controls, or excluded predators with mussels and then mussel mimics, and waited three years to see how biodiversity accumulated. And this is what we found. Um, this is in the high intertidal, low intertidal, so less stressful. Uh, this is bare, 
And in any of these plots, if you go to one that's really aged, you can find up to 30 species. It's a pretty diverse system. Um, over a three year period in a bear, uh, in a high zone, uh, only two species showed up. It was an invasive barnacle, uh, and this one species of algae that can survive outside the mussels. And what we found is that there was no effective caging that couldn't be explained by cage control. So predators over three years had no effect on this intertidal system. That's the first intertidal system I've ever seen that could be the case. If you shade and a cage, it really doesn't have biodiversity. It's only when you put rocks or muscle mimics or muscles themselves that you get biodiversity coming back. And we do that with a sponge. It turns out these muscles are creating this really nice condominium in there that doesn't dry out. And all these animals, if you tether them, they die within about 45 minutes. And that true rock near tidal animals, they can't handle that stress. And so the whole community was facilitated. We call that whole community facil facilitation by a foundation species under stress. Bob Payne didn't believe it, and this is Peter Grievous, so they called us up and he said, let's go down there and see that. This is a great story about Bob. He was um, almost 80 at the time. He's unfortunately passed recently. And so we had a whole consortium of students from the University of Patagonia who went down to the Rocky Shore. Bob had thick Coke bottle glasses. Could hardly see it. I didn't know how he was gonna deal with this Rocky Intertidal. So we get there after a four hour drive, we get to the Rocky Intertidal about right here, and he gets down on his hands and knees proceeds for three hours to crawl all the way to the inner title right there. Because you had to hold his arm walking through there. It was amazing. And he said, well, Brian, you're right. Maybe just for <laughs> So he did believe that there was whole community facilitation that sea stars were unimportant in the system. In Argentina, we've also found that facilitation is key for population persistence over time. And <clears throat> this is a, a really diverse two species community of plants. So we have this succulent here, and we have this herbaceous grass. And what we found is that because herbivory is so intense, likely due to predator loss in the area, but these herbivorous crabs um, love this plant, this herbaceous grass, but they, they do not like this succulent. And so this plant only has a chance if it grows up in this ring and has a neighbor around it and gets big enough so that it can withstand enough herbivory only occur on its edges. When it's very small, the crabs leave the entire plant. So these started out the same. You can see this had, didn't have a neighbor in this did. And you can see it's a different trajectory when you have facilitation occurring. Just a little bit, you change the, the population drift. Everybody has those examples. These are just from our system. So we've been looking at the role of mutualisms in community recovery after massive disturbance. So like coral reefs, forests, salt marshes are also experiencing massive die. But unlike most systems, they aren't going into an altered stable state. We see recovery. So we lose, every 10 years, we'll lose 300,000 acres of salt marsh as drought intensifies. So drought increases, we don't have rainfall. That stimulates overgrazing in these areas. We have snail fronts, crab fronts that go through and kill the grasses. Predators die off in the drought. And so what happens is, is that we get runaway grazing and physical stress leading to massive die in the system. So because it recovers, we have asked whether or not the role of positive species interactions in the ecosystem recovery after these massive disturbance events. And so we do our favorite experiment here, and we look at whether or not plants grow better with and without neighbors, and we see a big neighbor effect here, that if you grow plants, these individuals, and you put them out here in this die-off zone, that is very stressful because of low oxygen levels here, is they grow better with neighbors. And the reason is, is because plants are messy when they shunt oxygen into their roots. They open the stomata, oxygen goes down into the roots, and then it fills up and it leaks out. Microbes take advantage of it, and neighbors can take advantage of each other's leaky roots. And that's the mechanism. So we get big effects of growth. We also found that interspecific mutualisms are critically important and are likely the reason this system is not slipping into an alternate stable state as drought frequency increases. So this is a larger picture, a drone picture of a, a, of a smaller die-off area. And what you'll see, just like in most ecosystems, die-off is not complete. It's not like that little patch in the Rocky Inner Tidal. There are all these remnant patches. And it turns out those remnant patches are really, really important because this system closes up through clonal growth, not through seedling establishment. And so their high edge to area ratio means that they contribute disproportionately to the regrowth in that system. So we want to know why are those patches there? And it turns out that 
almost every one of these patches, about 98% of them have muscles underneath. There's a muscle mound, and this rib muscle builds mounds like this. Some of them are as big as this room, and it sinuously reefs. And about 1% of the marsh surface actually has muscles. But we found, even though they're only 1% of the surface, they determine or associate with 98% of survivorship. So we did experiments looking at above ground plant growth with and without muscles. They do bump up plant growth by about uh, 100%. Uh, they also reduce salinities. It's more like a shower drain, so it's always wet. And the marsh around here will drain through those muscle mounds. And they also increase nitrogen content in there through filter feeding. And in the process, they also attract predators that kill off grazers. So this is a, it's a stress amelioration zone. It's like strong positive interactions. And if you look at the regrowth and do some models and look at the relationship between die-out size and years to recovery, they see with, with muscles, or the spatially explicit model, is that no matter the die-off size, we always get recovery in 10 to 15 years. And that's about what we've seen through observations. But you get this interaction in that in small die-off size, it really doesn't matter if you don't have muscles, but it really matters as die-off and disturbance gets bigger, is that it takes a much longer time for the system to close in. And drought is coming about every 20 or 25 years, so muscles, the system closes up before the next drought comes because of this interspecific mutualism. So here's another one um, from seagrass systems. And we found that seagrass expansion into the tropics and productivity is highly dependent on this clam right here that occurs throughout the world. And the mechanism is there, it's nutrients, but they also have sulfide oxidizing bacteria on their gills, which is super cool. It's like a tripartite mutualism. And this sulfide, without the clams, the sulfide buildup in the warm tropics kills seagrasses. But the clams on the roots, they're fine, they're super productive. So a question you might ask, why would you replant seagrasses without that clam, especially in the tropics? And that's actually what's done in most cases. Another positive interaction besides interspecific mutualism is one we all know about and we talked about already, is an indirect positive or facilitation generated by sequential negative interactions. And we found in salt marsh systems that with the um, subsiding of drought, it becomes very important. And in relation to coastal wetlands and in conservation, we all know it's important to understand the paradigm of uh, ecological understanding of that system. And in marshes in many ways were the quintessential system thought to be controlled by bottom-up forcing. So as food web theory was developing, um, uh, in Harrison Smith and Slovakian from Yale and Hutchinson. The Odoms were coming down in the US um, and looking at Lyndon's 1942 paper on food webs and looking at energetics and looking at bottom up control of uh, trophic levels and dynamics and systems. And they came down here and looked, did observational work, and they found that there was really nothing eating the grass. And the idea was that these plants had won out on the evolutionary arms race. And this system represented a quintessential system controlled by bottom-up forces, where there was a severing of connection between top-down food web interactions. So it was considered a trital uh, food web. But we've done experiments, not only here in, 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 in marshes in Georgia, but around the world, and we found that actually uh, that observation was wrong, and that grazers aren't attracted to detritus, they're actually creating the detritus themselves. So when you experimentally test that and remove grazers from the system, this is what it looks like naturally. And if you remove grazers, that's the big effect that you get in some of the salt marshes. And we've also found that these snails and crabs that we find in Argentina, that we find in China, that are devastating those marshes, are highly regulated by predators. Not surprisingly, they're popcorn for all these predators that are coming into the system through a series of experiments and surveys. Uh, we found that predators are, are critically important for maintaining the system, and as drought subsides, these predators respond to high concentrations of grazers and suppress them. So, predators are important. These are three different positive interactions that are really key. And here's a, another one that we um, experimentally demonstrated for the first time in ecology in 2007. And this was the idea of a facilitation cascade, and terrestrial systems have been thinking about this for a while, of course, with trees and epiphytes, and we just gave it a new name. Um, and this is a system in rock intertidal in, in, in Rhode Island, and it's on the edge of marshes, 
veins because there's high wave stress. And one plant can withstand that wave stress and will establish itself and its roots then lay down and hold on to these rocks. And once they do that, the rocks no longer tumble around and the subtidal animals jump right up underneath those grasses. And the mussels congregate around the roots, barnacles lay on that, and then we get this biodiversity, biodiversity hotspot because this grass is there. We pulled away the mussels and all that biodiversity disappears without the mussels. They need something to hold on to. If you pull away the grasses, all the mussels die because they get cooked in the intertidal or they get rolled over by the cobbles. So we found that there is an obligate set of positive interactions that maintains biodiversity. You first have to have this foundation species, the grass boom. And then you have to have the muscle. And then you get this out of proportion effect on biodiversity, so facilitation cascade. So those are some strong interactions. The next question on the next few slides is asking when and where are positive interactions are important. Is through our synthesis, through theory, when we make predictions about where they would be important if you don't have knowledge of that system to begin with, or a little bit of knowledge. That system. So generally ecologists have done qualitative comparisons like this one, where we compare what controls biodiversity on rocky shores, and we compare to a temperate rainforest, uh, rocky shore and a temperate rainforest versus one in a desert, and we found that increasing climate stress that we shift from facilitation by predators to facilitation by foundation species. So there's different types of positive interactions with biodiversity there. But what about a more general understanding? Um, my advisor and, and Callaway uh, came up with this very complex model to predict uh, <laughs> how uh, interactions with your neighbor would change along an imaginary environmental stress gradient. So they drew up this straight line like this. It was actually a happy face hypothesis. Uh, this is the least complex, I'll put this one up here. And uh, what they found, uh, what they suggested was that as you increase stress, the drought stress in a system, heat stress in the system, cold stress, that you're more likely that that interaction with your neighbor is most likely to be positive under high stress than negative. And so people said, well, that's pretty straightforward. That's a good one to test. Let's just go across environmental gradients. And they've done that in a lot of plant systems. And we've looked at synthesis of whether or not that is true or not. And we've seen that it, it generally holds. This is quite a few number of studies across a variety of terrestrial and marine systems. This is the effect size, whether it's a net positive or net negative interaction. This is, um, this is with the stress imposed, this is without the stress, and this is how long they imposed it in those studies. And we see when it was a short stress that when you impose the stress, the net interaction becomes less competitive. And then if it's a longer stress, you get the switch here from competitive to facilitative. In general, when you put stress on neighbors, they tend to have more of a net positive interaction than a net negative interaction. So it seems to be something that's general. This paper gets into when and where that might happen. So we do have some quantitative support for the idea that if your system's under stress, positive interactions are likely to occur with neighbors rather than competitive ones. We just did this synthesis for habitat cascades. This is one of my favorite interactions just because it has such out of proportion effects. And if we, if we look here in this plant algal uh, filament interaction tree mistletoes. And we know the tree epiphytes, these are examples, marsh grass mussels, seagrass seaweed. In each one of these cases, the secondary foundation species um, is, is rare or just can't even exist without this, this first one. And then the second one really creates a lot of complementary heterogeneous space. Um, it ameliorates different types of stresses and it creates a, an abundance of niches. And we found that this is common throughout all ecosystems. You can find examples. It's something we could potentially take advantage of more in conservation or restoration. And we found that it, it was more important and had a stronger effect on biodiversity in more stressful transitional systems. Um, and then some trends in freshwater or not. So there was a big effect of these facilitation cascades on biodiversity. And if you, we compared it to the syntheses that have been done on predator facilitation of biodiversity, and these effect sizes were larger. We've also looked at ecosystem type and the effect of predator facilitation of plants. Um, and in this case, we found that predators are more likely to facilitate plants and indirectly um, have a positive effect on their growth in salt marshes. There's a positive effect 
versus mangroves where we saw no effect. Generally, there are cases. So if you're restoring salt marshes, you may want to pay more attention to the federal system. So, positive interactions are important. That's just our system. You guys have all the examples that are going in your system. What if we systematically change our view and say, let's, let's cash in on positive interactions. Here's a flow diagram. So we've done about five or six of these papers for system-specific ones for corals, coastal wetlands, mangroves, and then we've done general ones as well, papers like that. And then we continue to go out there, and it doesn't seem like designs are changing in those environments, and so we ask, is anyone reading or heeding our papers or listening to what we're talking about? And it turns out when you talk to managers, or if you look, only three, in restoration ecology studies, only 3% of all studies uh, in our data set looking at Oyster reef seagrasses and salt marshes specifically tested for the impacts of positive species interactions. Even though without them, the ecosystems don't recover or barely recover at all. So very few are testing for that. And we also find that in the designs, they aren't um, incorporating them very much at all. So it doesn't look like it. People are reading them, maybe not changing what they're doing. So we decided to change perspectives on the applied component of our lab. And we wanted to look at what methods were being done in restoration, and then try to change those designs without much money difference, and say, can that make, uh, alter the trajectory that we're seeing? So this is typically how you would plant coastal marshes, oysters, mangroves, and you would separate individuals and keep them away from each other to avoid competition. But our paper suggests that you should instead, you should clump them and not disperse them. So if you control for density and just look at configuration effects, uh, we did that. We did that in the Netherlands. We did that in salt marshes in the United States on the east and west coast. And this is what we found. Here's the data slide. This is from Florida. This is from the Netherlands. Survivorship and biomass. And again, we did a, a stress gradient. So we did uh, elevation low and high. And low elevation is more stressful because there's more flooding for these terrestrially evolved plants that are moving back into the ocean. And what we find, remember, they all start off with the same biomass. And the black bar is clumped. So you see there, after a two-year period in the low zone, we see a almost 100% increase in survivorship and a 300% increase in plant biomass. So initial conditions the same, just put them together so they touch. High elevation, we see it's less strong, but still strong. And we see the same pattern in the Netherlands. But notice this, this is really interesting, is in the high intertidal, we have this interaction very small, it flips. In the high intertidal in the Netherlands, it rains there all the time. It's really not stressful at all. And clumping had an adverse effect. They actually should be dispersed. And so we took this information and we talked to policy managers and they said, really what we need is a schematic. This really doesn't help us. So we, we came up with this as a, uh, so it incorporates positive species interactions but also theory. The idea we know they're important, but not in the stressful part of the disturbed environment. And so we suggest that the high intertidal, they should have dispersed plantings and they should be clumped in the mid and low intertidal. Now we're doing this restoration managers. This is actually as the key, as a conceptual diagram, bring an artist in there, something that communicates well. And, and their restoration policy makers are testing this at a larger scale. We're doing this with clams uh, now in seagrasses. And seagrasses are, are, are really taking off. Seeds are becoming effective now in restoration, but we have a lot of failure. And so we asked two things. Is we've, um, we put clams underneath shoots that were outplanted and also seedlings. And we found huge effects. Uh, seedlings all die without clams, and with clams they all survive. Not all survive, but the flock gets big and the flock grows over time, and we get a doubling or tripling of growth rate with clams underneath. And these clams are easily available. Many times they're just over here on the sand flat, so they can be collected. And you only need to put one or two underneath those seagrasses. So it has a whopping effect for a small cost in those environments. And we've done mussels and marshes, and it does the same. Um, what about trophic facilitation? So one of the things they do on the Great Barrier Reef and um, on our reef system is they pull off coralivores, and one of the ideas is that with the loss of predators, there's an outbreak of meso consumers in the environment. And in this case, uh, can this really help with the restoration of maintenance of these systems? So we went in and actually experimentally test whether this intervention actually has the outcome. Because people are saying it doesn't, there's nothing really, local interventions don't help guard against global stressors. 
So we, that's a mostly observational data, but we want to experimentally test it. So we pulled these, uh, we removed all the snails from these uh, brain corals, we kept some as control, and then we, we increased their densities as well to naturally occurring high densities. So we had like 0, 5, and 10, sort of a great undergraduate project design, and uh, very simple, and then we got big effects over a year period. Um, first of all, we found that five snails ate about 5% of the coral head a year, tiny bit, and 10 snails ate about 8%. It was just, it didn't, just minuscule. We thought the corals were winning. But it had a huge effect on that, those ability of those corals to resist bleaching. So um, we had bleaching in October, and we went back and got bleaching data. This is a, a method that Hope and others uh, here came up with, a colorimetric uh, assessment of bleaching. And what we found is with high amount of snails, we get a significantly different than average for uh, a removal. And this is the amount of bleached tissue. So if you you pulled off, uh, if you had high density of snails, it went completely white. All of those anthelia were gone. But if you had lower numbers of snails, the bleaching was only partial. So they re retained their those anthelia to an extent. And the cool part was the recovery. Like, if you were this, is that what bleaching looked like? You turned into a basketball rally. Just nine out of 10 did. If you were like this, you were much more likely to recover and grow back. And this is what this shows. This is looking, the bleaching severity is high here. And if you have high bleaching severity, tissue mortality is almost 100%. Mm -hmm. Low bleaching severity, you're likely to return to normal over time. So this is one of the first experimental demonstrations that a local intervention uh, of stress reduction locally can actually increase the resistance of corals to global uh, warning stress and bleaching stress. So that's a positive interaction we certainly should include. And this is one of the um, last examples with restoration. And this is one of my favorite stories. Brent Hughes is a former postdoc in our lab. He figured this out, it was just amazing. Is that in Elkhorn Slough, California, one of the, it's the toilet bowl of California. It is, it smells bad, there's rafting, algae everywhere. It's like pea soup. Um, what happened about 14 years ago, sea otters started coming back in. They were beating each other up in the kelp forest. They're pretty mean to each other. And they moved in there and they just started eating everything. They eat 25% of their weight a day. So they'll eat a crab like this and they'll go back down and get an empty worm that's like this big and suck it down in a minute and go get another one. It's just amazing to see the animals eat. And what happened was oysters were, as otters were coming back, seagrasses came back and they're like eight or nine feet tall and they're like kelp beds that in there now. And at low tide they float on, so you can see them just bending like this. And he figured out that was because of trophic interactions. And that otters, by eating all these crabs, facilitated sea slugs. And these sea slugs proliferated, even these isopods here, and keep the seagrass blades clean, and therefore they don't get overgrown by algae. It's fueled by nutrients. And check this out. This is amazing. So what happens? We have nitrogen loading. And if you're a marine ecologist, you learn about all through the stable states and seagrasses, and what you know is there's a tipping point that's supposed to happen at about 60 micromoles. And that's when the seagrasses disappear because they get overwhelmed with uh, algae in that system. Seagrasses die, it becomes turbid, they never come back. It's too turbid. It can't happen unless you just lower nitrogen in the system through big. And this is where Elkhorn slew. This is auto recovery. Uh, and this is, uh, this is what I want you to look at. Is it's super high up here. In these areas, this is where open slur is, and this is where the super corrective seagrass beds are. So they're up there and they're expanding like crazy in the presence of one of the highest concentrations of nitrogen in any extra. And so this shows us that sea otters are naturally allowing for natural recovery of seagrasses, and now they go plant seagrasses only where there's otters in those areas, and they grow. If you plant them without otters, they get all the seagrasses die. And so we're getting massive expansion. So here's an example of last couple slides, what these things can do. So you can imagine you're um, at a, a conservation table and you're thinking about, okay, here's our ecosystem, the amount of corals, or forests, and here's our physical stress, it's drought or warming. And this is where the threshold in the system is. And typically the way you manage for that, to stay away from that potentially tipping point is to reduce um, some stressors or, or the multiple stressor perspective. Uh, and say we'll reduce some threats and therefore they'll be able to withstand, for instance, a global threat. We'll reduce global threats. 
And we want to stay away from that. That's where we manage that. Well, the alternative we present here is that you could actually expand that threshold if you insert or maintain positive species interaction from the systems. So if you pull off these grazers in the system, you increase the threshold we know about 10 to 15 percent for forest. So it's another 40 years or so. So that's that's a pretty nice positive species interaction. So if you quantify that, if you look at mussels and marshes, it their salinity tolerance goes from a, their drought tolerance goes from about a negative 2.3 to a negative 4.2 on the drought Palmer index. So they can withstand much higher droughts as long as those mutual resistance are there. And so it increases the threshold in the system. And sea otters, that's a, almost a thousand percent increase. It's a huge effect. Um, we had a great question yesterday about what about, uh, does that mean we don't have to reduce the nutrients in the system and the pollution in the system? Well, there's a, other effects as well. And that would be a fun one to discuss. But the alternative to manage to stay away from the threshold is to expand it with insertion of positive interactions. So this is the last slide before conclusions. Um, some people will ask, well, what about, this is great, the predators are having an effect. Uh, we don't have these predators in the system. One of the things we noticed in coastal wetlands over the past 10 years is that we're more and more likely in nature reserves to be stalked by large predators. And this was something that was not supposed to, so we were being stalked by alligators, which are freshwater crocodilians in these salt marshes. And we started to see sea otters, which are supposed to just like kelps, they were coming into seagrass and salt marshes. Um, in Patagonia, we saw puma in the, in the grasslands, which was the mountain lions. So we're seeing all these animals misbehave. And if you start looking at the literature, it's pretty common that after local conservation success, and we do have success stories, is that large animals tend to expand, as the work is going in the rivers in some places, out of that habitat that we thought they were specialized in, it was their favorite, and they're moving out into other, other environments. <clears throat> And for many of these, they're doing better growth wise. Alligators, unbelievably, can deal with fresh water. They just go get a drink of water like we do. And they get back in the ocean and they just have a smorgasbord. There's so much food there. Their growth rates go crazy in these coastal environments. Wolves are coming down. So there's a lot of uh, ecosystems out there that have an opportunity for positive feedbacks from predator expansion, <coughs> not just the sea ocean. So what we're doing now, and this would be fun to collaborate with people here, is asking what happens when you layer positive species interactions and conservation value? What happens if you bring them in in fisheries management and do self-organization with communities and self-organized seagrass beds? And then if you layer those, do you get synergistic, I doubt it, but maybe get some additive effects or um, some other things that would really bump that? How far can we go in increasing the resilience of these systems if you layer? Certainly, I, I mean, with sea otters, it, 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 clams are important for the seagrasses, but sea otters are the obligate one, but you add clams or clump and they actually grow better. So positive interactions can increase restoration success and increase system diversity. They're important in all the systems we study. I'm sure they're important there. Um, and for marine conservation, we really need to systematically list all the positive species interactions. So for coral reefs, we can't just say we have to have parrotfish. What, Kenny gave a great talk and he said, these cleaner fish, you never get talked about in conservation, but have potentially really strong positive effects by affecting the density of herb, uh, herbivores. So we need to systematically look at those. And then the like result is that we're going to lower conservation costs while enhancing system resilience. So hopefully a little optimism that we <laughs> untapped uh, efficiency in conservation. So thank you very much.